Well, folks, it has uh, it has been quite a while since I made a video, and I'm sorry about that. You know, I've been having to uh, been having to do real real human things and participate in society, getting a job and stuff like that. It's uh, you know, it's a lot, but you know, I am of course making time for the botany videos because it's very important. And uh, what I've brought us to today, brought in, good God. Anyway, the location that we're at today, it's a really really cool ecosystem. This right here, this is a true sphagnum bog, and it gets that name from this very, very cool uh, genus of moss right here, which you can see some of down at the base of these, uh, I believe that's actually an invasive uh, buckthorn. See that little moss down there? That's a sphagnum moss, and what's really cool is that uh, that moss, it does an excellent job at retaining water. I believe it can, like, absorb up to, like, eight times its weight in water, which is really, really neat. So it holds water really well, and so you get this really cool this floating mat which allows me to do this you know i'm kind of wiggling the boardwalk i'm on you see it's getting a little bit a little bit rambunctious in the bog perhaps but anyway what you see what's really cool about the sphagnum bogs is the circumstances that allow them to form because they're kind of a rare ecosystem you know you don't really get a lot of the sphagnum bogs but what occurs in order to create them is they're uh it's uh glaciers are what's responsible here in a lot of ways because what's happened here in this area of western michigan around the great lakes what you get a lot is that the great lakes or is that the glaciers as they advanced and receded you know they dug out areas very very deeply in the landscape leading to formations like kettle holes i believe they're called and other structures like that and basically sphagnum have colonized it and just kind of created this nice mat uh, on top of a bunch of water and decaying matter which you can see right here the water seeped up above the sphagnum mat but there will be about like I'm not sure exactly probably like 20 feet of sphagnum and then there's a bunch of water under that that's just full of uh, decaying stuff and there is of course you know water seeps through the uh, seeps through the moss to give you this top so it's pretty cool but you get all this floating vegetation which allows you to rock the boardwalk if you're getting a little bit rambunctious maybe you're gonna make someone seasick but anyway it's a very very cool ecosystem because a lot of the plants here they have evolved uh, very very specific adaptations because while the sphagnum, you know, it's a good ecosystem and it allows for plants to colonize it, you got to be a special kind of character to uh, survive out here. Because it is a very nutrient-poor ecosystem. So you can see that there are, in fact, a lot of plants that have very, very cool adaptations in order to survive in that kind of environment. Such as mycorrhizal relations with fungi, as well as carnivory. So it's a really, really cool ecosystem. They're pretty rare. And I'm going to show you guys some of the, uh, some of the lovely inhabitants of it today so i do hope that we can enjoy that together getting a little bit uh having some fun in the box oh yeah so I mentioned the uh, the nutrient poor conditions of the bog, but I didn't really get into the specifics. But if I'm going to be highlighting the uh, the cool adaptations, I do have to kind of dig in a little bit further to it. So basically, the soil chemistry here it's very very acidic, which is something that plants can't deal with well because acidic soils they don't really have a lot of nitrogen, which is a nutrient that plants need. But there are of course certain groups of plants that have evolved to uh, thrive in these nitrogen poor acidic environments, and one of those groups of plants in particular is the Ericaceae, and that's the blueberry family and there's a couple of really really nice members of that in this area of course let's check out this guy first this is uh this is leather leaf by the way this is camadaphne colliculata they call it leather leaf because these leaves they're very they are in fact rather rough and coriaceous look at that orange fuzz on the underside if i can get the camera to focus oh look at that isn't that gorgeous you know and that's all over on top of the the floating mat and what allows this to succeed in the nutrient poor environment is like a lot of members of the blueberry family it is myco it's got mycorrhizal associations with oh look at that you can see some fruits look at that nice developing nice developing leather leaf fruits apparently this uh this character managed to get pollinated and is producing a, a new generation ah that's lovely but anyway as i was saying they've got mycorrhizal associations with uh fungi in the soil which allows them to of course basically get that nitrogen from the uh, from the fungi uh, which allows them to succeed in an environment where nitrogen normally wouldn't be available but because these plants have got that that nice tight relationship with the fungi as a result of their evolutionary shared history they can succeed in even these this really really interesting ecosystem another member of the uh, the Ericaceae which of course we all know and love Vaccinium, the blueberries. Oh, don't you love that? Oh, look at the sphagnum down there. Do you like that? Do you like the bog? Do you like the sphagnum mat? What if I say bog with a Chicago accent? The bog. The bog. Sorry. Anyway, uh, 
right, as I was saying, vaccinium. This is, I believe, vaccinium. I think it's the high bush blueberry, which is vaccinium corymbosum. Uh, could be low bush blueberry as well, which I believe is vaccinium angustifolia. Uh, not too sure. I believe I could eat those berries, but I'm not gonna, you know. Better, better to save them for some critter, you know. But another mycorrhizal, lovely member of the Ericaceae, which is thriving out here. Uh, a cool little graminoid. Not in the Ericaceae. This is a sedge. Got to take a little sedge detour, of course. This is uh, Rhynchospora alba. I believe is the uh oh man I don't even know what the common name is on these but it's a lovely it's a lovely white sedge you know it's very very distinct you might confuse it with the uh the areophorums the cotton grasses but if you look up close you can see that distinct you can very clearly see it in these they're not as fluffy as the areophorums and also they are uh they've got a very clearly sedge inflorescence which is not usually the case with the areophorums the areophorums look more like dandelions unless you look at them real close but anyway the vaccinium the camadephni and of course there's another little guy Another little guy that I was inspecting that I gotta find now. Oh, here it is. This is Vaccinium oxycacos, which is the bog cranberry. Another thriving member of the Ericaceae. You can see these nice developing fruits. If I point the camera at the right goddamn thing. Oh, yeah. Look at that, Vaccinium oxycacos, absolutely thriving out here in the bog, producing some nice fruits there. That is, of course, the small bog cranberry. There is a large bog cranberry, but I don't know if I, uh, I've seen it. I'm not really, I don't know. There's a lot of plants out here that are kind of new to me, so it's really cool to see them all in their, uh, thriving in their native habitat. There is, of course, I believe that this shrub right here. I believe that this is a non-native invasive buckthorn. But anyway, Vaccinium oxycacos, uh, right there focusing on the fruits. Ooh, isn't that lovely? So some awesome members of the Ericaceae there, which have, of course, adopted a mycorrhizal response to the acidic soil conditions, allowing them to thrive. And you can see right next to the, uh, right next to the bog cranberry. Oh, what's that? That's our net, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the other highlighted group of plants that have adopted a really, really cool response to the, uh, to the nutrient poor soil conditions. That right there, that's Saracenia purpurea, which is what we're going to be talking about next. We're going to be talking about another mechanism, which is, of course, carnivory, which is something that people really, really think is pretty neat, and I think it's neat as well, because with plants, you think of them normally as, like, kind of stationary organisms, but no, out here in the bog. Out here in the bog, the plants will take you down. You'll get hit in the face with a bunch of uh, bunch of goddamn poison sumac. You'll be on your on your backside for weeks. But anyway, let's talk about some other cool graminoids real quick, because I do I do love the graminoids, you know, the sedges and such. Here's another really cool sedge. They call this uh, three-way sedge, which isn't dirty at all. Um, as you can see, they call it that because it is three-ranked. You can see those nice distinct rows of leaves. You can see. Oh yeah, it's like a nice triangle. But anyway, you can see this one's in flower right now. If I zoom in, very shaky, had a lot of caffeine. Uh, those little, those little, uh, filamenty looking things, those are, I believe, the styles, which are, of course, the female part of the plant. Most sedges are monoecious, by the way, so you're gonna have separate male and female flowers on the same plant. But you can see those little styles, those are, of course, receptive to pollen, so that's what'll get fertilized. What we've got right here is, uh, oh god, some kind of juncus, I believe, maybe juncus canadensis. I don't know, I'm not too good with my juncus. You got a lot of, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty junkus at it, you could say, actually. I don't really know what this guy is either. There's a lot of very cool, the graminoids are very, very, it's a very diverse group, and a lot of them look very similar, so it's kind of rough. Here's a little Carex, though. This is a bit past prime. Let's see, what do we got? Wow, uh, this is Carex, uh, this right here, this is Carex lazio carpa or Carex polita. You can see it all over there, like a nice, a nice green spaghetti all over the place. Uh, you distinguish the two based on the presence of a mid-vein on the bract. This one doesn't have a mid-vein. Uh, so I don't know which one that is, but it's the one that doesn't have a mid-vein, which you know. There you go. That's how you, uh, that's how you ID plants. Get a load of the sphagnum down there. Oh yeah. Okay. How about we talk about some carnivory, folks? Let's do it. So, uh, kneeling amongst the lovely, uh, Spireo, which is a native member of the Rose family that we've got right here, not 100% sure of the species, uh, amongst them and the Rhynchospora alba, we have our first carnivore that we're going to be talking about. I've seen three out here, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to be able to find the, uh, Utricularia because it's a little bit tricky in the water, but anyway, this is the first one, this is, of course, Saracenia purpurea, the purple pitcher plant. 
get a load of that gorgeous venation as you can see right there now the way that these guys are carnivorous how they uh, the mechanism functions on them is basically you can see all those trichomes on the lip there that's called the peristome by the way basically those trichomes they function to force a bug because there is a uh, I believe oh hang on I gotta go I'll rest that rest this right here and uh, oh man it's pretty tough pretty tough to get a good angle on the Saracene oh, I'll zoom out actually duh very stupid anyway so you can see right there, but there is a secretion right here at the uh, at the base, right at the lip of the peristome, right about here, and uh, that's got a nice sugary secretion. So the bugs they try to get that, they fall and they slip in there. And as you can see, can you see? I hope there is a little bit of water in there. The bug will get digested, and I believe that there is a. It's very cool. There is of course a. Uh, I think that there's a mosquito which has evolved. Uh, to actually put its larva in the uh, inside the uh, pitcher plant and they just thrive in there It's a very cool very cool relationship as you can see there are quite a lot of them I got to be careful as I stick my hand in here because I don't want to get nailed by a poison sumac uh, As you can see look at all those Oh Wow, they're doing absolutely fantastic and you can see some of these guys are showing the the red coloration Which the uh, the species gets the name for Saracenia purpurea most of them, they're, oh god, they're just absolutely gorgeous. And what's really cool is that we're actually in time to see these in flower. Get a load of that. Isn't that crazy? So these, uh, these leathery, these leathery brown ones at the base, those are the sepals, of course. And what you've got is really cool. We're kind of past the uh, flowering time. You can see the remnants of the anthers. Those little brown things that have dried up. And normally there will be about five more petals hanging out, like about there. But basically this whole umbrella-shaped structure is, I believe, a style. So that's receptive, all, all that's receptive to pollen. And then I believe that there is a maturing fruit in there. You can see that swollen thing that the anthers are connected to. That's the maturing fruit in there. So uh, again, another successfully pollinated native plant reproducing. We'll try to find some more of the Saracenias because they are so cool to look at, you know, and just get a load of that, uh, just get a load of that awesome carnivorous. But that's one of our carnivores right there, Saracenia purpurea in the family Saraceniaceae. What's really cool about carnivory is that it's a, uh, it's evolved in a very, very broad number of uh, plant families. You know, it's a, I'm not quite sure what the actual number is. I'll have to look it up, but I've read the paper, and it's very, very cool. It's occurred in a very, very wide number of uh, lineages independently of one another, uh, which is a phenomenon which is known as, of course, convergent evolution, which is very, very cool to uh, study in depth, you know, and it just kind of just kind of as a reason why these plants have uh, adopted similar strategies in order to survive in similar conditions. It's very, very interesting to see that, don't you think? You might not. Ah, oh, and here's the devil which I was speaking of earlier. That right there with that lovely red midvein and that compound leaf. That's toxic adendron vernix. Poison sumac, also known as thunderwood. Member of the Anacarticaceae. Uh, you know, you gotta watch out for it because it is, it's a sneaky one. You can see this guy right here. He's lurking on the trail side. He's gonna tag me. Not quite though. I've outwitted the, uh, I've outwitted the immobile plant, which is, you know, that's a big thing for me. But anyway, uh, let's see what else we can get into. Kind of rambling, but we're gonna find another carnivore. Uh, a Drosera, a Sundew. Those are a little bit trickier to see because they're kind of small, you know, not quite as showy as the Saracenias, but we'll get some, we'll get some nice Saracenia glamour shots, of course, uh, as well as some Droseras, and, you know, maybe I'll find something else that's pretty cool. So, yeah, let's see what we can find. Oh, I'll get a load of the Swamp Rose. Isn't that nice? Gorgeous. Just a gorgeous native rose. Plant native roses. Don't plant the, uh, don't plant invasive junk like honeysuckle in your yard, unless, of course, it's a native honeysuckle. But then again, it wouldn't be invasive junk if it was a native honeysuckle, would it? I don't know if this is focusing. Ah, whatever. Anyway. Oh, yeah. So what we've got right here is a lovely, uh, a lovely native loose strife. This is, of course, uh, this would be Decadon verticillatus. You know, the, uh, they call it the swamp loose strife or the world loose strife because it's got that nice, that nice world floral inflorescence you can see there occurring in the axles. It's a little bit tricky though because, uh, you know, it kind of grows in the sprawling habit across the boardwalk, which might make you trip on accident, but, you know, this nice soggy area does give me a pretty cool opportunity to, uh, show you guys the sphagnum up close and personal. Oh, look at that. That nice little mat. Zoom in on that. And you can see, of course, the water, but watch this if I, uh, Gonna take a little chunk of this. And as you can see, this area is totally dry. So I'm just gonna look at all that. Sphagnum is so incredible, it 
keeping up that water. You see what I'll, what I'll do is I'll actually just place it right back here. It'll rehydrate, reroot, and it'll be just fine. So it's a very, very cool moss that uh, allows the, uh, allows the, so it's basically the combination of the, uh, of the really cool geology, the glacial activity, as well as the vegetation, the floating mat, which allows for the, uh, the very unique, unique organisms of the bog uh, to evolve and thrive. Oh, and here we go. Here's some Drosseras right here. Oh, shit, I've untied my shoe. Ah. Oh, God, look at all of them. All these little, these little tiny Drosseras. I think that this is, uh, oh, man. This is Drossera rotundifolia, I believe. Oh, look at the sphagnum standing up. Oh, God. I'm, I'm geeking out. Look at that. So the sphagnum, and then you can see those red little trichomes, of course, indicating the presence of the, the deadly Drosseras. Just lurk in there. And you see the way that these guys are carnivorous, it's a different mechanism than what you see in the uh than what you see in the Saracenias. As I mentioned, uh carnivorian plants, it's a mechanism that's evolved on uh many different occasions across many separate lineages. These guys are, I believe, I think these might be a member of the Karyophyllales order, and the pitcher plants are a member of the uh Aracalis order, two completely different orders of plants, very, very divergent from one another evolutionarily. Not 100% sure if I've got the names right there, I'll have to double check. But anyway, so the way that these guys are carnivorous, you can see those nice, those nice trichomes there, which are laden with those little droplets that give this plant the name of sundew. But what'll happen is a bug will land on there because it'll think that those uh those little droplets there are of course some nice sugary secretions. And the bug will land on there trying to get that and then the sundew will close up and wrap up around it, secrete some gnarly digestive enzymes, and uh it'll eat the bug. And then it'll take that nitrogen and it'll uh survive. Uh I'm around, it's around the right time to see uh to see these lovely little guys in flower, the uh, the Drosseras. Haven't quite seen one of those that uh haven't seen that happening yet, but I'm gonna have to keep my eyes peeled for it. But there, yeah, there you go. So there's a lovely bunch of the Drosseras, which is of course another carnivore that you get out in the bog. You've got the uh the lovely Decadon verticillatus in flower as well right here. And of course, occurring right next to it in and amongst the sphagnum, you've got the incredible the incredible Saracenia purpurea. Look at those. That lovely, lovely red venation. Can you just, you know, it's awesome. It's a plant you can appreciate even when it's not in flower just because of how it's evolved to survive. You can see them, they're just full of that, some kind of water. Oh God, those digestive enzymes in there. Isn't that insane? What if you got trapped in there? Oh, look at them. They're right next to each other, the two bog carn carnivores. They're cuddling. Oh, that's pretty cute. Look at that one just lurking. Buried in the sphagnum, ready for a nice dumb dumb beetle or something to come wandering in there. Give him a nice load of nitrogen. Oh, man. All right, let's go see if we can maybe try to find a, uh, a utricularia, which is, of course, yet another uh, carnivore that has evolved out to survive in the bog. And uh, maybe we can find a drops run flower. Ah, oh, wow. Aren't those incredible, the Saracenia and the Sphagnum mat? Ah, yeah. As well as the Drosseras. God, the bog. Welcome to it. Ah, oh, man, what an incredible place. Right there, what we've got is a, uh, a conifer right there. That's really neat. That's Tamarack right there. I believe it's, uh... Oh, man. Is it Larix Americana? Not really sure, but it is a it's a very rare tree because it's restricted to a very rare habitat, which has uh, largely been you know basically wetlands were never seen as very useful by people because biodiversity doesn't really have much of like a monetary value essentially, so they were ditched uh, into uh, basically agricultural land, and so as a result you know. You've got massive reductions in the amount of wetlands in states. For example, Indiana went from like 25 to, I believe it's like 4% in terms of wetlands covering the state, which you could say is progress because people need to eat. But I would say, well, you know, there's probably ways that we could do agriculture, which are not quite as wasteful with land. And we could have a whole discussion and it would probably be very, very, uh, very, very intellectually stimulating. But anyway, the point remains, because it lives in an ecosystem that's threatened by human development, the tamarack and all these plants out here in the bog, they're very very rare so it's just awesome to see them in their habitat and just their full their full glory you know oh god it's so nice out here oh man what a day in the bog so uh let's get up close and personal with a tamarack right now it's really really cool about it as you can see it's 
the way its needles are arranged is very, very distinct. You know, it gets them in these kind of, these whirls of needles. I'm not, I believe that the larches are members of the pine family Pinaceae. So they're arranged in, of course, the typical pine bundles, but they occur in these little, just basically these little, uh, little pocket. Oh man, I don't even know what the right term for that would be. They occur in these little growths, almost like axles, but not quite, ah, uh, man, hard to say. I don't know my, uh, don't know, don't know the vocab too good, I guess. But anyway, it's a very, very distinct structure. Uh, you understand what I'm trying to say, of course. It's very, very distinct and very unique. And it's also got these tiny ass little cones, which are very, very quite cute. Don't you love that? Don't you love some tiny ass little pine cones on the, uh, the lovely Larix Americana, the rare tamarack amongst the, uh, that's definitely high bush blueberry, by the way, because this one's taller than I am. And there's, of course, the toxic adendron vernix. Oh, God. Man, what if I just got, I'm going to get smacked in the face with that one day. I can just, I just know. Anyway, let's go find some more carnivores, perhaps. Now, uh, here's our third carnivore that I'm going to be showing you. Now, this one is not restricted to bogs. You can find this one in other wetlands and probably, like, lakes and other stuff. It's a pretty, pretty wide group of plants, the genus Utricularia. As I said, they're kind of tricky because, you know, it's a little bit difficult to find them uh, when they're not in flower, but, you know... I kind of know what I'm looking for, but anyway, what you can see that's really neat about these, you see these little tiny, uh, those tiny little bulb-like structures in there. You see those. Now that is why this plant is called bladderwort, because what those are, they're these bladders, and what they do is they've got a bunch of, uh, sensory hairs there on the, uh, on those bladders at the mouth. And when something swims by it, a small, usually it's small, uh, small macroinvertebrates, I believe. Not 100% sure. But, you know, they swim by that, and that bladder, the hair gets tripped. The bladder shuts, and it's an incredibly fast motion. Look up some videos of that, by the way, because that's incredibly cool to see. Even in slow motion, it's incredibly fast. But the bladder shuts, and then the plant digests that meal. And so, you know, there you go. So yet another carnivore using a different mechanism of carnivory. This is a guy that's also, I believe, in a completely different order from the other two carnivores that we've discussed. So basically what you're going to want to be taken away from that is that, uh, excuse me, burp there. Sorry, it's the granola bars. But basically what you're going to be uh, wanting to take away from this is that evolution is an incredibly cool, uh, basically, it's an incredibly cool force that acts on organisms in order to uh, allow them to survive in different environments. You know, you've got plants that are, of course, adapting the carnivorous habit in order to survive the nutrient-poor uh, bog environment. You've got plants like the Ericaceae members that we highlighted earlier, which are, you know, they've got the nice relationship with the fungi to survive in the nutrient-poor environment. And the driving force behind all those uh, features is, of course, evolution. It's that, uh, you know, it's that survival of the fittest that, you know, Darwin talked about. Endless forms, most beautiful and whatnot. But uh, speaking of most beautiful, we'll talk about some nice other pretty stuff, try to get some glamour shots and maybe find a Drosera uh, in flower. This right here, this is uh, Cephalanthus occidentalis. This is the button bush. Isn't that lovely? You'll note there you can see the nice four petals, if you look closely. The nice opposite leaves. This is a member of the coffee family, if you can believe that. Uh, whether or not you can, uh, I don't really care, because it's a member of the coffee family. That's the way it works. Uh, nice. Definitely at the Occidentalis button bush. Plant that as well. That's a nice one. If you got a nice, nice damp place, you can put that. It's a lovely native one. The pollinators go wild for it. The pollinators gone wild. Why don't you go look that up or uh, make a nice video or something about that? I don't know. I don't care. Let's go find some other cool stuff, and then I'm probably going to leave, because it is, in fact, uh, it's very, very hot, and I've been out here for uh, for a bit, maybe getting a bit dehydrated, I don't know. Look at all the cephalanthus. Oh, there's a little frog down there. Some little guys just hanging out. Oh, God. Oh, the bog. What an incredible place. Oh, there we go. There's a bladder wart and flower. Yay. I do get to show you guys. I believe that this little, uh, this little guy right here, this is the common bladder wart, Utricularia macroriza. Let me pull this up. So you can get a good look. Look at that. It's a gorgeous little flower. As you can see there. Isn't that lovely? That nice yellow coloration? Oh yeah. And you can see some nice red venation as well. There's a couple different species of Utricularia we get in this area. I believe there's two yellow species and a purple one. Not sure what the other uh, yellow species is called. I believe this is Macroriza. And the purple one is Utricularia purpurea. But anyway, get that guy standing up nice. Oh yeah. Awesome. Just some incredible carnivores. Let's see what else, what else the bog has before I head out.
Oh yeah, look at that. A nice decking down pathway for me to not trip on and fall on. Woo, wonderful. So uh, I was walking right by this one pitcher plant and I stopped and took note of this one in particular because as you can see, this one's got a little meal inside. It's got a little uh, little ladybird beetle of some kind. And you see the issue is, is that the ladybird beetle of course cannot escape because the, uh, the limb lip of the peristome is very very smooth and you know it can't get up and even if it could those trichomes would push it right back in so as you can see right there there's the success of the pitcher plant and this one's also pretty neat because you can see you know some of the pitchers have got a little bit more of that purple coloration they kind of get that as they uh as they mature and die off you see there's some but it's actually got some uh look at that it's a little maturing flower this one's not done yet so that's pretty very, very neat to see. And what I was noting in this area is that there are some just some absolutely massive colonies of the pitcher plants. And as you can see, look at these just bizarre flowers again, you know. Just get a just get a load of it. Really take it all in. And just that massive, massive bunch of them. Oh god. Isn't that crazy? And those pictures are, of course, you'll note that they're green, so they're photosynthetic. Just absolutely incredible. It's seeming like I'm not going to be able to find any of the, uh, any of the Drosseras in flower, unfortunately. So, I am going to have to leave you with that. I hope you've enjoyed the, uh, the excursion into the bog. Uh, protect native ecosystems and, uh, I don't know, read a book, do something, do something good for someone, you know? Go, uh, get smacked with a toxic adendron vernix if you disagree. Anyway. Take it easy.